Hey everybody, uh, welcome to your weekly sermon, super awkward edition. <laughs> uh, yeah, some people have these fear of public speaking in front of large crowds. For me, I don't know if it's a fear or what, but I get totally thrown off my game speaking to a video recording device in an empty, in an empty room. So we're going to have some hiccups and bumps along the way here. We're going to suffer through this together, uh, but uh, yeah, it should be fun. I guess the good news is I can't uh, see Chip Harper over here making faces at me uh, from his normal pew or Karen Cowan over here drawing doodles, you know, or whatever. I can't even see if you're walking in late, so I know who it is that walks in late each week. Anyway, so welcome to your, your sermon. Um, uh, and here's the thing, we are, we, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but because of some late in the game changes to our live streaming plan, uh, we're actually pre-recording this. So, and I don't know how this is all coming together, so I don't know if you've been officially welcomed yet. I think Fuzzy's going to have, have maybe done some songs with us here, but I don't know if you've been officially welcomed. So, if not, grace and peace to you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And if by chance you are new to Grace Church, maybe you got this link from a friend uh, or you're coming in here, hey, welcome to you too. Uh, this certainly isn't the normal way that we do church, um, but uh, glad that you're here, glad you're tuning in. Um, if you want to know more about us as a church, plenty of information about us on the website, uh, including information about how we're trying to be the church uh, these days with all that's going on uh, out there. So uh, we're still kind of learning as we go here. Uh, but so here's the plan for this morning. It's kind of weird, it's actually Saturday night right now, but I'm going to say this morning because that's probably when you're watching this. So here's the plan for this morning. Uh, we are going to be working our way through uh, some verses in Revelation chapter 1. And I'm going to go ahead and just be, uh, I'm going to let you know how it is that we arrived at Revelation 1. And I'm working through that today. And I'll be kind of honest with you here. Uh, this this whole week, this whole past week, I was an exercise in me getting my head in the game, I think, in a lot of ways. Uh, obviously, this is not the way I would prefer to do church, um, and so it was all week working up to get excited or enthused to, to do this well. Uh, again, I would have been, I would have more, much more preferred to do 15 live services with 10 people or less, uh, right, than do this live streaming thing or whatever, but thankfully, uh, we've got uh, good wisdom on our board of elders and cooler heads prevail on that one, right? But so then here's the thing, right? We put a plan in place on Tuesday. Probably wasn't until Thursday night when we got our live streaming team together, went through all the details of the service and everything, that uh, that I finally say, okay, I'm excited to do this, ready to go. And and then it was Friday, yesterday afternoon, that uh, in light of just some new developments that have come out in Pennsylvania, state of Pennsylvania, new restrictions from the governor and all that, uh, that our elders just, we kind of decided together that, hey, we really need to strip this service down to the bare essentials, uh, not bring people out of their homes together uh, if we don't have to. And so now it's just me and this camera in this empty sanctuary. And I got to tell you, uh, I, I was not, I felt like all over again, um, I was less than thrilled to, to do this. I, if you talked to me last night, if you're part of the staff or my family, anybody who interacted with me with last night, uh, you know I was was not really a happy camper. Um, you know, and I guess part of the reason for that is uh, I, I'm realizing in all of this, really in. in in even more significant ways, just how much I not only enjoy, but uh, have come to depend on the corporate gathering, the corporate life and worship of the church. Uh, I've shared with you guys before that, uh, you know, from my earliest days of recollection, right, God has powerfully used the, ch powerfully used the church to grow and to shape me as uh, who I am. And uh, it was my fascination with and my love of the church that ultimately led me into pastoral ministry. And I can say sincerely, too, that in terms of my own walk with Christ, uh, I experience him uh, most powerfully in the context of the church gathered, in the life and the communion uh, of the church. 
right? And so when that's taken away or when that's messed with, um, <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't sit well with me, right? I, I can feel uh, the spiritual weight of that uh, or uh, the spiritual impact of that. And uh, I can also feel, I think I can recognize it, some, some just blunt selfishness in me too, right? When it's t- something that I love is taken away, the selfish part of me uh, is not happy about that. And it messes with my head, it messes with my heart. And so I, I'm telling you this because, you know, I, again, I'm being honest here. Here's, here's, here's the thing, right? Um, well, anytime... Uh, feeling spiritually distressed or selfishness is rearing its ugly head in my heart and in my life, right? I'm less than thrilled about getting into the pulpit and preaching. And uh, this week has been an exercise in prayerfully trying to gear up for this, okay? But I'm, I'm telling you right now, and I'm just being honest, that I don't feel, right, in any position to give a real spiritual pep talk here or rally the troops and, you know, give you the, give the charge, you know, and, and all that, right? Because I'm still working through this and, uh, you know, and my head and my heart haven't fully, whatever, I haven't, I haven't been able to deal with this fully, mentally, emotionally. Um, and uh, so what you're getting somebody who is somebody who's walking through this process uh, right along with you here. And what you're also getting uh, from me this morning is a little bit of what I, I know I need to do. Um, uh, I, feel, as I was praying about this this morning and what, what in the world we were going to look at together. Um, like I, being aware of my own heart and my mind, what I was realizing is that I, I do, need to do the obvious basic thing of look to Christ, right? And see Christ in his church. And... So what you're getting is basically me preaching to myself. There's no one else here. Quite literally, I'm preaching to myself. You're sitting in. <laughs> but I think also, too, this is the best um, that I can give to you at this time as well, too. The advice is look to Christ uh, and see him in all his glory in the midst of the church. Long way of saying that's how we got to Revelation 1, because that's what Revelation 1 is all about. Um, and... Yes, yeah, so let me just dive in. Let me, let me read the verses for you that we're going to read, and then I'm going to pray, and then we'll just kind of talk our way through, okay? So Revelation 1, I'm picking up in verse 9. Uh, this is from John. He's writing to the churches. He says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. And then I turned to see this voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man clothed with a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. And from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him... I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and living one. I died, but behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. So write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are yet to take place after this. And as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word, Uh, this word that is uh, literally a sword, um, sharper than any two-edged sword uh, that that pierces and reveals and exposes us, uh, but also encourages us and uh, shapes us as your people. And so we ask that you would attend your word by your spirit and by your grace 
uh, allow it to do its refining work uh, in our hearts uh, as we attend to it. And we pray this uh, for the honor of and in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Okay, uh, real quick crash course uh, on the book of Revelation. Um, written to a church that's having a pretty rough go of it. Right? We think we're, we're having a hard time these days. Uh, the ancient church uh, at this point in time certainly had it far worse. Uh, they're knee-deep in the hardships of being Christ followers in the midst of the Roman Empire. Right? Uh, a lot of people think that the book of Revelation was actually written uh, right around the time of some pretty intense persecutions from Emperor Nero. Uh, they have uh, become accustomed to being ostracized from their community, ostracized from their family, from their workplace, and all that. Right, So life is pretty difficult for them. Uh, that's who the book is written to. It's written by John. Uh, who himself has got it pretty pretty rough. Uh, he's in forced social distancing or forced social isolation, if you will, uh, in prison on the, Pat on the island of Patmos. Right? And that's why he says in the very beginning, I, John, a fellow participant uh, with you in the great tribulation, in the kingdom, uh, and in the patient endurance uh, waiting on Christ. Now, those are things we don't like to think of together. We don't like to associate uh, enjoyment of Christ's kingdom with the experience of tribulation and having to wait on Christ to come and make all things new. But uh, this is part of the dilemma in the book, or, or the dynamic in the book of Revelation, really throughout the Old, Old Testament, that New Testament, sorry, that the kingdom of Christ is advancing uh, while yet the church is enduring hardship and suffering. And so John is writing to the church as a fellow participant in all of that. Uh, and one other quick thing here about the book. Uh, the book of Revelation, it's designed to paint very vivid pictures for you because it wants to capture your mind, to capture your attention, and help you see um, the greater dynamic of what is taking place uh, in the world all around them. Right? Think of yourself in the ancient church. What you're experiencing very vividly and what you're seeing very vividly is the power of the Roman Empire and the power of Caesar and the power of Nero, right? And you're feeling that pretty intensely. And it certainly looks like on the ground level that the gospel and the kingdom are, are failing in light of the power of the Roman Empire or power of whatever, the forces of evil and darkness and wickedness that are raging against the church. So what this book wants to do is show you the deeper realities that are taking place behind the scenes. And I just got done doing my sermon walk over in John Hines. Uh, I, I did it uh, again here today on Saturday. And um, I mean, as you're looking around, you're seeing uh, the signs of spring, right? Flowers are starting to bloom. Trees are getting their leaves out. Uh, which is, but it's also signaling the end of what has been the case for the past several weeks, several months, that where I could see into the woods, right? And I could see beyond uh, the trail just in front of me, right? Because there were no leaves on the trees, no flowers on the bushes or anything, right? So I could see deep into the woods. I could see the animals or the streams, you know, or whatever. I could see the eagles, you know, perched in the trees, or I could see the, uh, the, the great horned owl nest at the one spot in there, right? But now all that's going to get start to get covered back up. Uh, that's often the way I've, I've thought about the book of Revelation. It's like seeing through the forest. It's the forest with the trees removed, right? So you can see uh, the deeper physical, spiritual realities that are taking place uh, in the world all around us. And so what you have here in Revelation 1 is this very first vi uh, vivid image that is meant to capture our attention. It's an image of Christ, right? Um, John says, first of all, he hears this voice. And the voice tells him to write down what he sees and send it off to the seven churches. He lists the seven churches, but uh, you keep in mind as well, too, that seven in the Bible, it's the number of completion and perfection, right? So this is to be sent out and to read and to be received by the church in its fullness, right? So he hears this voice and he turns around and then he gets this glorious vision of Christ, right? Not a vision of Christ as this peasant baby in a manger, or a vision of Christ walking down the street with his disciples, or even Christ on the cross. Now, this is a, a glorious vision of, of Christ in all of his radiant majesty, right? It starts talking about, and it just kind of 
you know, paint the picture here. Uh, it talks about his, his head and his hair is uh, white, uh, white as snow, right? This picture of purity or maybe a picture of holiness, right? And then it talks about his eyes as uh, being like flames of fire, you know, and if you think about that, if you think about, especially in the Old Testament, right, the association of fire with the holiness and the purity of God, right, that image of fire is not necessarily a comforting one. Right? Think of, you know, the fire at the burning bush where Moses had to, whoa, you know, not come any further and take his shoes off. Or you think about the fire that descended onto Mount Sinai in the wilderness or the fire that descended upon the tabernacle or the temple, right, signaling that the holy presence of God was there and you dare not get too close, right? Because God's holy, people are not. God's pure, people are filthy in a lot of ways, right? But, so here's the good news of this picture. Jesus is also in his priestly garments, right? He's got his long robe on, he's got his priestly sash around his chest. Uh, and then it was the Old Testament, it was the priest that mediated that tension, right, between a holy God and unholy people. The priest offered sacrifices and atoned for the sins and the filth of God's people so that they could in some way brought, be brought near to the living and the holy God. Uh, Jesus is uh, the, the greater high priest. Right? He's the one who, in his flesh, <clears throat> excuse me, offered the full and final perfect sacrifice and now, uh, day in and day out, or, well, now just constantly is presenting that sacrifice uh, to the Father so that as the great and perfect priest, he can be bringing uh, us as not yet made right, not yet made perfect people into God's holy presence. Right? So when we see those eyes of fire, uh, we, we don't we don't fear them. We don't fear that we're going to be consumed by these flames. Rather, we uh, almost rejoice that uh, those flames would come and do their refining work in our hearts and lives, right? Because we know that our sin has been atoned for, our guilt has been forgiven, our shame has been covered by our great high priest. All right, let's see what else we got here. We His feet uh, are like burnished bronze. Um, that's a symbol of firmness, steadfastness, think like a, a bronze statue that's firmly rooted on its bronze foundation, right? It's unshakable. Uh, it's a, a, again, that, I think that's sort of the picture here. Uh, his voice is like the roar of many waters. And then all, verse 16, here's a powerful image. In his right hand, he holds the seven stars. Uh, in the ancient world, right, um, uh, astrology was big business. I mean, everybody wanted to know uh, how, how the future was going to play out. If they're going into battle, they want to know how this battle is going to be, be won. They need to know strategies and how this is going to unfold. And so you often look to your astrologers and, uh, you know, to give you some, some wisdom along those lines. And what do the astrologers do, right? They look up into the heavens. They look at the stars. And basically the way that they did this was you had the 12 constellations of the zodiac. And think about these constellations, right? When you're looking up in the, in the night sky and you see a constellation, you know, the, the constellation itself never changes, right? It maybe moves across the sky from one night to the next, but the constellation itself doesn't change. But, right, what does change is that every now and then you see stars in different positions uh, in relation to these constellations, uh, we understand these um, uh, non-constant moving stars to be planets, right? The planets move in an orbit around the sun, and so the planets are always moving in and out of these fixed constellations. I don't know if this makes sense, but... So if you're an astrologer, here's how you go about your business of astrology. You're always reading where these other seven stars were. They could only see seven planets back then, right? So they called them these seven unfixed stars that would move seemingly, randomly, through these constellations. And the astrologers would read the, you know, where these stars were in relation to the constellations, and they would make their predictions, and they'd come out with their wisdom based on that, right? 
Uh, so it was these seven stars, these seven planets that you know, people viewed were that determined the fates of you know, their lives and their kingdoms. And of course, these stars were related to ancient Greek gods, right? Jupiter, Mars, Neptune, Venus. So I think, and a lot of people pointed this out, there's, there's real significance to Jesus saying, okay, give me those seven stars and let me paint this picture for you. Who's holding the seven stars? Who's holding these things that you all look to, um, to as, as holding the power, as holding the key to destiny and to your futures and to history and all that? Who holds that in the palm of his hands? I'm looking over here to my left for, for Ray to give me the answer here, but he's not here. Jesus does, right? Jesus is holding uh, those stars. Jesus is the one who, in his exalted lordship, uh, determines... Uh, the fates of kings and kingdoms, who determines the destinies of his people, who's shaping really the whole course of history. Right? Though the nations rage, uh, though emperors are plotting against God's people and are trying to tear down uh, this, this kingdom of Christ, yet it is the exalted Christ who is um, giving shape and sovereign authority to, or exerting his sovereign authority to the affairs of history. And then two, right, we, we learn a little bit later on in the passage that it's that these stars are actually symbolic representations of seven angels that have been given to the church, right? And so it's Jesus going further and saying, okay, yeah, these seven stars, they do represent these heavenly beings that control sort of some of the affairs that are going on in creation, but they're not just these random um, disconnected gods out there, but instead they are these seven angels who have been given to safeguard uh, the life and the mission of the church. In other words, it's this really powerful and neat picture of Jesus who holds in his right hand right, these seven stars, symbolic of these seven angels who take their cues and their commands from the king of all creation and who exert their power on behalf of the church, safeguarding its life and its mission. Do you see it? Let's keep going. Um, out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword, right? The word of God, this powerful sword. Uh, we can talk more about that, but I'm going to keep moving here. Um, he says in verse 17, when, when I saw him, I felt his feet as though dead. Oh, let me back it up, right? He's also talk about his face, which was like the sun shining in full strength. And if you were out and about today, uh, the sun was in full strength, and it was, you know, really bright and was making all the colors pop, you know, the you know, new flowers and leaves and all that. And on a nice cool day, the sun was providing warmth, uh, right? So I think that's sort of the picture here too, that, right, like that Jesus' face was the source of light and warmth and life that was a blessing. We'll come back to that. Tuck it away. So verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. It's a great posture to have uh, in, in trying times, right? When you catch a vision of of Christ is to fall at his feet in worship. Jesus reaches out his right hand, says, hey, don't fear. And then he starts to give his credentials. Uh, he says, I'm the first and the last. Uh, I think our Apostles' Creed that we've been working through and how we've talked about those things. Talk, remember how we talked about Christ as being uh, the pre-existent one, right? Who was there with God from the very beginning, the one through whom all life and all creation began, right? So he was there in the beginning, and he's there through the duration of history all the way uh, to the last. Uh, and he says, I died, uh, but behold, I'm alive forevermore. Right? This is the Jesus who came and entered into human history, took on human flesh, and who endured in his flesh right, the full weight of sin, wickedness, evil in his creation. He endured in his, in his flesh the full weight of of the raging of the of, of empires and uh, political authorities and religious establishment, he endured in his body uh, the full curse of disease and the brokenness of creation. Right, he suffered it unto death. But right, he's the one who is alive. He's the one who has yet come out victorious on the under end of it, and he's the one who is alive forevermore. Meaning that uh, that. Death, that disease, that wickedness, that sinfulness, it no longer and never again will have 
any power over him. Uh, he is eternally victorious over the power of death. Uh, and then he says, and I have the keys of death and Hades, right? which is cluing us within that uh, his victory over death is something that he intends to wield for the life and the well-being of the church. Uh, over in our house, we, we have a couple gates, two, two gates set up uh, to keep our our, our new little wanderers uh, from going into places maybe where they shouldn't go at certain times during the day for whatever reason, right? And and it's working right now. The gates are keeping them, you know, contained where that wherever they need to be. By no day is coming when little Georgia uh, is going to figure out how to open these gates. And I also know that when she does that, it's not just going to be her going through there, but she's going to open the gates and it's going to be like jailbreak or whatever. She's going to be calling to Jeffrey, the little brother, and saying, "Come on, let's go. We can get through here. This too." Uh, and that's sort of the picture that I have here, where not only is Jesus the one who has defeated death and is alive forevermore, but he's got the keys to death and to Hades, right? So that he can spring the great jailbreak, right? So that he can gather his people and call his people out into participation in his resurrection and his victory over death. I mean, just think about how encouraging of a picture that is, especially for the ancient church. Right, as they're looking out and they're seeing the power of the empire, the power of Caesar, power of you know, violence and wickedness and oppression that's being unleashed against them. Right, maybe they think, well, I'm sure they're mindful that the worst that could come of this is death itself. So here's Jesus saying, yeah, but I've suffered death and I've come out victorious and I've got the keys to death to bring resurrection life. I think, too, uh, for us, uh, we could ask a similar question. What's the worst, po worst case scenario, worst possible case scenario with all of this coronavirus and COVID-19? Well, it's death, right? That's the ultimate worst case, worst case scenario. But we too need to be reminded that Jesus is raised victorious over death and he's the one who springs the great jailbreak, right? Corona brings death. Jesus brings re resurrection. <laughs> um, yeah, there's something in my mind that I want to say, but I'll, I'll, I won't. I'll save that for some other time. The, the maybe the, the the outtakes here. <laughs> uh, corona brings death, but Jesus brings resurrection. I feel like that should be a, a phrase that we keep in front of our mind, right? Jesus brings resurrection. He's already accomplished the victory, and he's got the keys for the great jailbreak, right? So we don't need to ultimately live life in fear, right? The one who holds the stars in his hands, controls the destiny. He's controlled where this church is headed, and it's headed toward resurrection life, to the full and participation with him. Let me keep going. He then says, let me tell you the, let me explain some of these symbols to you. And this is where he explains what the stars represent. And it's where he also talks about these lampstands. And he says the lampstands are the churches. And so here's, if you ask me the really cool part about this whole vision, right? If you remember to the beginning of the passage, uh, John sees this vision of, well, let me ask, we'll put it this way. Where is Christ in this vision that he is seeing? Jesus, he is where? He's in the midst of the lampstands, right? And what are the lampstands? The lampstands are the church, right? So this whole vision of Christ, here's the cool part, this whole vision of Christ, it's a vision of Christ walking in and among in the very midst of the church. Right? This isn't some abstract theolo theological picture of Jesus. Uh, it's not a picture of Jesus hauled away in some heavenly place somewhere off, way off in the distance. No, this is Jesus as we've always known him. Right? Jesus who, uh, who, who lived and breathed and walked with his disciples, you know, teaching these knuckleheads what it means to, to follow him. Uh, it's Jesus who would enter into the homes and have dinner with prostitutes and tax collectors and even Pharisees at times, uh, right? It's, it's this Jesus who would stop along the way and, and gather the children to himself, right? These often overlooked people in, in Roman society he would gather them to himself and he would love on them and teach them and, and talk to them. He would go to the, the lepers and the outcasts and he would be near to them and comfort and encourage them, right? This is Jesus as we've always known him, the Jesus who took on flesh so that he could live and breathe and walk amongst his people. 
This is the Jesus who, in the end of Matthew 28, says to his disciples, All power and authority under heaven and earth now belongs to me. So go out into all the nations, making disciples, baptizing in them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And behold, what? I'm with you, always, to the end of the age. Right? That's the picture here. Right? This radiant, glorious, majestic Christ in the midst of the church. Right? And that's the picture uh, that, that John wants us to see, that Jesus wants us to see. And so I think the takeaway from this, or the, the admonition from this, is to open your eyes and to see Christ in all of his radiant glory in the midst of the church. Right? For the ancient church, it's to look past all that's happening on the surface, on the ground level, right? and to see the deeper reality of Christ in his power and authority with, near to, and among the church. Same thing for us, right? We're probably all fully immersed and saturated, uh, sick to death of hearing all this stuff about coronavirus, right? Because we've seen it in our news feeds. We're taking up whatever new latest information we can get on this stuff. And this is probably what's controlling our mind or, or consuming our mind and our vision and our sight. And I know for me, what I'm preaching to myself right now is I've got to look to Christ. I've got to see Christ right here with me, right here with us his church, in all of his radiant glory. And I think that's the admonition for you too today. Right? Look past all this stuff that's consuming our vision on the ground level and see the exalted, risen Christ present with his people. i got to say too, right, there's symbolic significance to calling the church his lampstands. Right? Uh, that's not just an empty metaphor there. There's... there's a picture there, right? That the, the church is called to be uh, these lampstands that radiate light. Or in other words, we're called to be these lampstands that radiate the, the light of Christ in, in darkened places, right? And if you were to keep reading in the book of Revelation to the specific letters that are written uh, to the churches, there'd be a lot of reference to this business about being the lampstands. And you got to be the lampstands. Don't make me come and shut the lampstand off, right? And all that. In other words, the lampstand, it, it is symbolic for the life and the mission of the church. Right? It's what we're called to be. We're called to be lampstands that shine, the, that radiate the light of Christ, both to each other and out to the neighborhood. Right? We've got to do it with one another, uh, right? because for a lot of us right now, this is a very difficult time. It's a spiritually taxing time. Um, it's a time where there's a lot of uncertainties and the path forward seems a little dark or blurry. Right? We need one another right now to shine the light of Christ in each other's lives. And we're going to have to get creative in how we do that, folks. Um, you know, obviously, the normal ways are, are being taken from us right now. Uh, so we've got to get creative. Uh, we've got to go old-fashioned letters, emails, phone calls, uh, whatever. Uh, but we have that responsibility to be the light of Christ, to be essentially, essentially the very, continue to be the very presence of Christ for people who are having a hard time seeing him. Uh, we also need to be the church, uh, the lampstands for the neighborhood as well too, right? Right, now more than ever, uh, we need to be the, it's floundering around in the dark, right? The neighborhood too is, is doesn't know how this is going to shake out, doesn't know what's going to happen to their, you know, their 401k or to their job or whatever, and they're all floundering trying to figure out what is the solution, how are we going to get through this, it's the church, right, that is called to represent the ultimate pathway of light and life, to radiate the glorious light of Christ. So I think that requires of you um, staying on your game, um, not using this as a time to say, okay, I can just retreat, focus on staying safe and healthy. I mean, yes, you do that as well too, but this is not a time to forget about what it means to love your neighbor and to care for them, and to shine the light of Christ for them. And you have to get creative in how you do that as well, too. I'll tell you, for us as a church, uh, we're starting to have that conversation with local officials. I've been in contact with school leaders saying, hey, how do you need the church in this time? I'm going to be getting on a, a conference call uh, this week with, uh, I forget what it is, Pennsylvania's executive health crisis team or whatever, basically from the governor's office with a lot of other pastors and clergy in the area, and we're going to be hearing from them what it means to be the church now 
or or how they are intending to use the church or how we can how we can be available to the neighborhood to the community uh they've got some ideas so we're going to listen in on that together and we'll be kind of reporting that back to you as we go uh, trying to figure out how together as a church to be the light of christ in, in darkened neighborhoods big picture and i'm closing with this bill batdorf wherever you are you're adding this cue the landing the plane <laughs> sound <laughs> here's the here's the admonition <laughs> see christ in the church right see christ in all of his radiant glory right with his is as white as snow head, right? Representing all of his holiness and his purity and his goodness, right? With the eyes of flaming fire, right? With, um, you know, the feet of bronze in his, in his priestly attire that um, represents uh, him as the one who has atoned for our sinfulness and our wickedness. See him in all of his power and his authority holding in his right hand the seven stars, which are the seven angels deployed for the life and the mission of the church. Hear him say, I'm the first and the last. I'm the one who died, but now is alive victoriously forevermore. And I've got in my hand the keys to the great jailbreak. All right, see that. Let it encourage you, that vision of Christ and his church. Let it bring you peace. Let it bring you joy. And let it empower you to not shy away from your mission and your purpose and your calling now, but to be all the more bold and be all the more um, confident in your calling to represent Christ and be the light of Christ both to one another and to the places that he sends us together. And so maybe my benediction, um, borrowing from that image of his radiant face, right, will be the benediction from the book of Numbers uh, where it says, May the Lord bless you and keep you. Uh, may the Lord shine his face upon you, that life-giving, uh, radiant face full of blessing. May his face shine upon you, and may he give you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There, we made it. Made it through this. <laughs> Hopefully you're still with me. Hopefully you're still with Hopefully you didn't tune me out and skip over to John Piper, or Alistair Begg, or Tim Keller. Not that I would blame you if you did, but... Um, Stay tuned. A lot of information going to be coming. I think Pastor Mark is, is up next, either right after this or a little bit later on this afternoon uh, with how you can get on with a more interactive Zoom conference meeting. We're all getting stretched here in our use of technology. So stay in touch. Stay on mission. And uh, yeah, we're, we're going we're gonna to learn new things about what it means to church. And uh, I think we're, we're going to come out all the stronger uh, as a church in our life and mission together on the back end of this. So, all right, shutting her down. See you soon. <laughs>